Happy Good Friday, everyone, and welcome back to episode two of Undivided. I'm here today with color commentator and host of the Option Podcast, Jason Devilius. I'm Ashley Clark, and this is Undivided. As promised in episode one, we're going to cover a crucial current event to kick off the show. But don't forget to stay tuned for the fresh take on Caitlin Clark and the Angel Reese controversy, as well as a thoughtful discussion on the double standards and hypocrisy of the elites. So here we go. Ashley? The last two days have been a whirlwind of media attention for the former President Trump as his 34 felony counts of falsifying business records related to hush money payments to two separate women, Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. This indictment was handed down in New York on Monday, and this story is still evolving. A quick guest appearance for us today is ADA and civil attorney Joey Mitchell. Let's hear what he has to say. So, Joey, welcome to the show. This, I know you've been following this case, and I really appreciate you, you coming on. We know that your particular focus is, is more civil than criminal, but I know you have your hands in everything. So they, they say a great, um, um, the best offense is a good defense. What do you think the defense is going to do? Do you think that the motion to dismiss is going to be applicable to statute of limitations? Talk to us a little bit about uh, criminal procedure here. Absolutely. Uh, so there's there's a number of things you have to look at with this. Um, you guys understand the concept of tolling, right? When they leave the state, they can kind of stop the clock on it and they can keep things going, you know, as long as he's out of state or his presence in state, you know, Trump has uh, properties and things in New York, but it was sort of a, a proactive take on it right so they they waited for him to come back or they put the pause on the clock or I'm, I'm in the same camp as people like mark levin or alan dershowitz that have said yeah there's gonna be a conviction in this uh look at look at steve bannon for instance right with the the washington dc stuff and how he was held in contempt they got a conviction because the jury's biased they got a conviction because the judge was biased they got a a conviction for that it's I think it's likely to get a conviction in the trial court and then it'll move on up through the appeals process and however that'll play itself out. Yeah, well, I guess my other question is there's some attorneys that don't share them. Dershowitz, of course, was a former Trump attorney and he also represented Mike Tyson and he also represented Norman Epstein and look how that went, right? Mike Tyson wound up in jail, Norman Epstein wound up dead and Trump wound up not paying him for it, I guess. So, so I think it's really, if this survives motion for dismissal, um, because a judge could just say, this is ridiculous. This is, this is not, an, COVID's not an exception to this. This is an exception to this case dismissed. Uh, and a judge could very well do that. But let's say a judge said this, that, that your motion to dismiss is denied. What comes next? Yeah. So procedurally they'll, they'll move forward with that. And that was the whole putting off, um, what Trump's couple attorneys said yesterday or so after the proceedings went forward with it, said, hey, they want to hold trial or they want to hold the first part of this in January, right during the first part of the primary, you know, and that gives credence to the idea that it's entirely political, right? That it's a hit job, that it's to stave off the lead GOP candidate to, to do all of these things. And hey, let's push it further on down the road. Let's go with this. Even if they were to convict him, though, there's no precedent. It's actually in the opposite that Trump could still run from jail. As as a lead. it's happened what two or three times in American history. Yeah, I understand you're not allowed to vote if you're a convicted felon, but there's certainly no law that says you can't run for president. And that's just uh, that brings new meaning to the term American irony, doesn't it? But <laughs> I, but yeah. I so the statute of limitations. I have one more question. Statute of limitations. Just educating our audience. Um, it's two years statute of limitations if they consider it a misdemeanor. Um, and five-year statute of limitations that they consider the felony. And this is, is this is why you think they went with felony because that was their best chance of it surviving statute of limitations? Absolutely. And if you had a chance to read the indictment, it's 
34 of the same things for bookkeeping errors, right? So it's uh, invoices, check stubs, <laughs> and uh, ledgers uh, entries. So what was great about the post arraignment interview that Alvin Bragg gave, there were some very smart people in that room asking very smart questions. And one of the answers that Bragg couldn't come up with was, what's the actual crime that's underlying here? And his response was so bold that it was, well, the law doesn't require us to state that. And yet it's still just more puffery of what you know, he ran on and what he, I'm going to go get Trump. So that's, that's just more and more of the same. Ashley. So kind of on that note, my question is what, what makes these 34 felony counts of bookkeeping errors different from any other bookkeeping errors in a presidential campaign or in a president's book or anybody else's book for that matter? What makes this different? Right off the top of my head, he's got a nice big R by his name. And further further along with that, it's along the same lines. The, the Hillary Clinton campaign, Jason and I were talking about this the other day, kind of did similar things. But hush money, paying someone hush money is not illegal. Um, keeping accurate business records is not illegal. Uh, having people sign, uh, you know, um, NDAs, not illegal. At contracting however you see fit and having people agree to it, not illegal. And when most people are slapped with a minimal fine and threatened with, oh, here's community service or here's what we can back down, the expression or the indictment of 34 counts is, yes, is under what they call prosecutorial discretion. But at that point, when you're throwing all that stuff up against the wall, you're just hoping something sticks, right? That's the shotgun approach. And it's it's hit or miss sometimes. And we'll see if, if anything sticks. Wow. Well, I really appreciate you joining us today and offering some clarification on some of these things. I definitely think it's going to be interesting as it unfolds, not only in the coming weeks, but leading into the end of the year and into the election cycle. It's going to be very, very interesting. Yeah, thanks for joining us, man. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your day, guys. So Ashley, mine's called Jadar. We don't actually have a word for you. So Ashley, what's on your ADAR? <laughs> well, Kaylin Clark and Angel Reese are both outstanding female athletes, setting an example for young girls all over the country. So the question I wanna ask you is what kind of example do you want your kids to see on the television? I, for one, am disappointed that yet again, we are allowing mainstream media to run with a narrative that was created to once again, divide us. Because if we really cared about our women in sports, the example they are setting for the next generation and the delicate balance of sportsmanship and competitive greatness, then we would be focused on the positive that these two women bring to the sport as well as the records that this NCAA Women's Basketball Championship game shattered. Here's how I see it. Kaylin Clark is one of the most aggressively competitive athletes I've seen. She's a boss babe baller and I'm here for it. Her display of John Cena's You Can't See Me was clearly in the spirit of competitiveness. And from what I've read about Caitlin's year, she's no stranger to these kinds of gestures. One thing I'll point out about her gesture, though, that we've all seen from the Final Four game versus South Carolina is this. No opponent is near her. On the other hand, Angel Reese is a baller who seemingly has a chip on her shoulder because she's been judged and put into a box throughout the year by being called ghetto and hood, according to Angel in an interview. As you've seen, Angel Reese is blatantly mocking and rubbing in Caitlin's face the same you can't see me gesture while also pointing to the ring finger indicating where she's gonna wear her national championship ring. You can't find a video or a picture of Angel doing this gesture without Caitlin Clark in it. And that is the issue for me, context. So it's not that you need my opinion, likely because you already have an opinion of your own, but the difference I see between these two similar gestures is the context in which Caitlin was expressing pure competitiveness because let's face it, she played lights out. 
Did you know that over 60% of Iowa's points scored that night in the final game were scored by Caitlin, or at least assisted by her? She carried her team and left it out on the floor. So my next question for you is this. Why can't we recognize Angel's blatant mocking of Caitlin Clark for the unsportsmanlike behavior that it was without making it a black and white issue? At the end of the day, let women compete and stop allowing the forced narrative to put you into a labeled box. And let's look at the real issue, the double standards and the hypocrisy that plague our society. So why is it okay for a male coach to behave a certain way towards his athletes? But when a woman speaks in a similar fashion, she's fired for her tone being too harsh. Why is it acceptable for Djokovic to act out against the referees in his tennis match? But when Serena Williams does it, she's gone mad. So in my personal experience as a female athlete and now a coach, I really just want us to be celebrating the accomplishments of our fantastic female athlete and role models for our young kids. Okay. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of this, from my personal perspective and my personal experience as a coach, there is absolutely a double standard when you're comparing a female coach and the way she approaches her athletes and a direct correlation to a male coach and how he approached their athlete. If you put two, a male and a female into a gym, and you ask them to say the same things in the same fashions, I bet you the woman gets more consequences from what happens in that room. You know, Ashley, I think the only thing I could say about this is, where do I start? <laughs> where, <laughs> where do I start? Well, uh, well uh, let's start from uh, present to past, because you said something very, very, uh, in the beginning about Caitlin Clark, um, uh, where I have a... Uh, professional, I'm, I'm also a coach and a former player where I have a professional belief in personal philosophies that go with that. Mm -hmm. so, but we're going to deal with that in a minute. What you just said more, um, more recently is very, very interesting in a sense that there is this male exceptionalism. Uh, from the, we, I mean, you, you, we talked about, you talked about racial overtone and we're, now we're talking about sexist overtone. So let's address the sexist part first. There, if you look in the NBA, and if you look at college basketball men's, there is a whole bunch of showboating. There's a whole bunch of um, showing people up. There's a whole bunch of, of that going on in, in almost every sport. Uh, mixed martial arts, you'll see Conor McGregor with his hand, both hands behind his back in the middle of a match, you know, because he already knows he's got it locked up here. He knows he has his timing. So um, from a sexist perspective, it's very, very unfair, and the double standard continues to, to, to rear its ugly head. Now, what we're looking, I guess what, I'm, what we're looking for in a general sense, because uh, um, me personally, like Coach Carter said, mm -hmm. when is winning not enough? Right? Do you remember the episode in Coach Carter where they knew they were better and there was a little chatter back and forth, but they, when they were winning, they, it, winning wasn't enough. They had to keep, keep talking and they had yeah. to keep showing them up. And, and that's also a culture that some people consider acceptable too. It's not, it's not my bag. Uh, um, don't get me wrong. I, 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 as a former athlete, if I played against someone that I played against before, there'll be some chatter across the net. But the Absolutely. audience, but the audience, just like a film, gets it. They, they, these guys played against each other, and they're like, "Wow, we want more of that." And yeah. it's, but it's not, it's not show offy and personal. But the only thing I could say about that is I can't judge somebody for doing it their way just because I'm doing it my way. I also have a general rule of what goes around comes around. If that's who you are. If you're going to do the You Can't See Me, that's John Cena, the um, the NBA, uh, the um, WWE star that just yeah. made that. You yeah. know, I mean, he, we went from Small with the Rock is cooking to that guy. And <laughs> he, the Rock teases him, too. You can't see me. Pick up you can't see me. The Rock teases him all the time, and John Cena's like, man, stop. So, but getting back to that, I say if you can dish it, you have to be able to take it. And this is where my ire for the, the sports media and even mainstream media has caught on, mm -hmm. latched onto this, onto this sense of slip. Yeah. Where my ire against them is hard to forgive and impossible to forget, right? Because the one person in this equation that had zero problem with Angel Reese is, is Caitlin Clark. Yeah. Caitlin Clark is like, look, I did it. She did it. We shook hands. There was a classy thing, a classy thing at the end. And and that should have been the end of it. But you got guys like Keith Olbermann who were saying, you know, 
she's a total this. Someone calls her a piece of that or whatever. Now, now we both agree uh, maybe she went the extra mile too far, and that's that's her way of sending a message. Like, um, if you ever watch the Untouchables, um, you send one of ours to the hospital, send one of yours to the morgue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and but I have a general philosophy: if you can't di take it, don't dish it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is. This is, it should have been a big nothing burger. Should have, it should have just stayed there, there that Sunday night, um, which, by the way, was one of the, easily the most viewed um, college women's final. Yep. Right? It, it shattered records of sh a lot of sports finals and shows. Yeah, I'll bring you two, for example. It shattered the Stanley Cup, every Stanley Cup match since 1973. It shattered the, um, the 2021 NBA finals. Wow. Uh, I had this long laundry list, but because I'm already talking too much, I'm just going to give you those two and drop the ball from there. But, but, you talked about the, the male and woman part. Allow me to talk about the race part. And then I, I'll give you the floor back, I promise, because this is, this is sports and, man, we don't step into it. And you know I love to talk about sports. <laughs> Conor McGregor, MMA star, mm -hmm. brash, threw a dolly at a bus, injured two fighters, took him out of the fight, punched an old, a 60-year-old in an Irish pub. Uh, and this guy is... Person people out, fought Khabib Nurmagomedov, knows he's a Muslim, insulted his religion, insulted his father, and he knows because he knows he's bigger than his father, right? But as soon as he makes his f fight with Floyd Mayweather, as soon as Floyd decides to get street, like shut the F up and talk in a way that people consider thug, which is code word for, for whatever some people interpret that to be, all of a sudden the media is like, this is an S show, this is a crap show, oh, I can't, you know, this is, this is bad for sports. But my thing was, why didn't you shut that down when Connor was acting like that? And there is, I'm sorry, but there is a racial overtone of when a white person does it, he's competitive, or if you don't like it, beat him. You know, so if you don't like it, beat him, because that's what they were saying about Caitlin Clark as well. But uh, I'll give you another example, football. Tom Brady, one of the biggest trash talkers. Um, uh, Phil Rivers, you know, we're from mm -hmm. L.A., Phil Rivers, man, was, you know, you had people wanting to fight him in the parking lot. <laughs> he does that. It's competitive nature. He's trying to get into his, his, his opponent's head. But when Terrell Owens says, I love me some me, he's a locker room cancer. I'll bring you, uh, and lastly, bringing it back to the sport of uh, basketball. When you ask any old school basketball fan who is the biggest trash talker in the NBA, they won't say Magic Johnson. They won't say LeBron James. They won't say half of the people you see in the NBA now. I mean, you can't, they're, they're a dime a dozen mm -hmm. now. They will say Larry Bird. They will say Larry Bird. Larry Bird is like, I'm going to catch this ball right here at that spot, and I'm going to shoot him in your face. The, he would say that to people. And he's like, that's all you got. I, I, I mean, the guy, the guy was so bad or so obnoxious with his trash talk. Dr. J, Julius Irving, punched him in the face. <laughs> Julius Irving, uh, I'm, going, I'm dating my age, but Ju if Julius Irving punches you in the face, that's like David Robinson getting a technical foul. You, you, you don't think what David Robinson did. You're like, what did the ref do? <laughs> so so um, I wanted to talk about, because you talked about men and women, and that definitely deserves its notice, but the reason why this became this knee jerk reaction by the media is because it came from uh, a, a, a track record, a story, a storied history of vilifying the black men for mm -hmm. what white people do all the time. Yeah. And, and the reason why I'm mad at the media is because they really didn't get that right this time. You no. know, they really didn't get that right this time. No. And, and like I said, I, I really appreciate and agree with if you can't dish it, then, or if you can't take it, don't dish it. Right. Because, mm -hmm. Really, that sets the foundation for for you to take hypocrisy and double standards off the table, mm -hmm. right? Because even if it's not the exact same or if it's a similar gesture in a different context, like I have no problem necessarily with what either of them did. Mm -hmm. My problem is the way that the media vilifies whoever mm -hmm. and then forces the narrative down our throats and makes us again divide on topics that really who cares and if who, they did this in the face or not who cares nobody and who takes the prime cuts right now now this is gonna now it's gonna get political right yeah i just told you guys this morning and this is gonna air later on but i just found out this morning that jill, dr jill biden the first lady had invited both teams to the white house now traditionally for the people that don't understand 
the, whoever wins the national championship, the winning team, and only the winning team, hmm. uh, gets, to, gets to meet the president, goes, gets to go to the White House. And Jill Biden wants to invite both teams to the White House. And everybody's like, oh, that's, that's a feel-good gesture. But I'm going to ask you a very tough, uncomfortable question. If Caitlin won, if the University of Iowa won, would Jill invite LSU? We know the answer to that. We know the answer to that. I don't like it because they're throwing a woman to the mob for, for their media gain, for their clicks. And now politicians are there to take the prime cuts. And here we go. Here we go again. Mm -hmm. Here we go again. And right, putting the elite in this position where they can dictate the rules, rules that they're not going to follow themselves. Which leads me to our next segment, by the way. That's going to be my, on our radar, on my radar, or my jadar. We'll be back after this. I hope you're enjoying this new Be Better Media production of Undivided, produced by my company, Be Better Media. To see the world of why we are striving to share inspired edutainment, I invite you to please check us out at BeBetterMedia.tv. That's BeBetterMedia.tv. Welcome back, everybody. It's time for What's on Jason's Jadar. Well, early in the spring of 2021, there was an NCAA men's volleyball match at the Pyramid, Long Beach State University versus Stanford. And during the timeouts, there was a woman walking back and forth in front of the bleachers, equipped with a paddle-like stick with a sign attached to it that said, mask up. She and her supposed cuteness was motioning with the beat of the music with an upward gesture for the people in the section to pull their mask up. It was something like this, side to side, elbows up, side to side. Now the crowd was a mixture of people who did in fact had their mask on properly, but there were others that had their nose sticking out, perhaps to breathe. And there were people who put down their mask to give condensation a break, and there were people who just stopped caring. In the meantime, just feet away from the regular seating section was a VIP section. Booze galore, smiles, sweat, a red face good time. No mask, not one single mask. Now there are a lot of reasons why Paddle Mask Lady didn't go up to that section and carry out her unofficial assignment. And the reason was obvious. She knew that the people in that particular crowd would most likely have told her where she can stick her paddle. <laughs> but the reason underneath the obvious was, believe it or not, it was more uncomfortable than that. The reason was we as people had been trained to treat a section of people differently. On our best day, we choose to ignore them and concede to their elite exceptionalism. And on our worst day, we choose to even defend these people with a rigor and heightened emotion unparalleled to even how we would stand up for the ones we care about, love, and have befriended for decades. Fast forward to 2022. The White House Correspondence Dinner, a room full of politicians who took recommendations and made them policy, combined with the media, the fourth estate, in whom they weaponize as frontrunners for moral preening. Do we call out the multiple entities that are the leading candidates of our divisiveness on policies, which they are not only the exception, but also stand to profit? No. We collectively ignore them, and in many cases, as I said before, even defend them. They are the advocates of the ad hominem attacks. They are the ambassadors of the bandwagon fallacy. They are the rulers of rationalization, and we love them for it. A collective of people who took it so far in shaming you into nuts, into seeing it their way, sometimes with consequences hanging in the balance, it has become difficult, if not impossible, to come back from it. The Hill, The Hill Rises Batya Unger Sargon, said it best. Play the clip. And I think that, um, you know, if they had simply gotten a study, said, here's what this study said, here's the information, you know, you make up your own mind. Or even if they had said, here's the study, here's our interpretation of it, here's what we recommend based on this study in like a respectful way, I don't think they would have had such a hard time now saying, hey, actually, that study was wrong, here's where we're going now. It's the fact that what they said was, they didn't say, here's this information, you make up your own mind. They said, this is the truth. And anybody who doesn't agree with us is a grandma killer, is an idiot, is a moron, hates Americans, is individualist and not caring about the collective, is disgusting. You know, cable news anchors lecturing you, mocking you if you don't agree with them, right? The amount of kind of 
condescension that they built into this. We are the science. In this house, we follow the science, right? The amount yeah. of moral preening that they built into their approach to this, right, makes it now much more difficult for them to admit that they had been wrong, right? Which is a lesson to us all, you know? Always approach the things you think you know with a little bit of humility to the people who don't agree with you because otherwise you're going to be in the situation where it is extremely mm -hmm. embarrassing, you know, to have been wrong. From gala events to the Super Bowl to the State of the Union address, it goes on. The resentment was apparent. Think about it. How many people do you think saw these maskless events on one day and on the next had to remind their five-year-old to wear their mask to school? The examples of exceptionalism go on. Roe versus Wade gets overturned? Doesn't matter. Because we all know that the politicians that banned it need an abortion, they'll get one. Coming for your guns? doesn't matter because we all know the peop the politicians that are coming for your guns, if they want to own a gun, or if their bodyguards need a gun, not a problem. See how this problem is bipartisan? We had a New York Democratic House member advocating for stricter pandemic restrictions while retreating to Florida with her boyfriend. We had a Republican senator telling his constituents in Texas to stay strong during the blackout while retreating with his family to Mexico. And we had billionaires at the center of influence of these politicians telling us to take the bus, take the train, and even not use your stove for the sake of climate change, all the while flying over your problems in a private jet. Perhaps the real reason why the problem is ignored is because there doesn't seem to be any solution on the horizon. No point in worrying about something if there's nothing you can do about it, right? Well, to me, as former, Jesse, as former Governor Jesse Ventura put it, the answer is as simple as the nose on your face, but as difficult as climbing Mount Everest. Stop voting them in. He's right. Stop <laughs> voting people in office who implement these asinine rules that they themselves have no intention of following. Do not look for examples to these rules, only to find exceptions. And for sure, do not look for leadership from these people to care about our quality of life, only to find out that they are the followers of the preservation of the quality of life of a small few. Do not look for your saviors in places where you only find oppressors. Oh yeah, my mask paddle lady, you can kiss my ass. So Ashley, is it really, is this rant I've been on more just about me drinking haterade on the, the, the people who have this kind of not for me, but for thee going on? I mean, are, am, am I concerned that this is a more uh, should be a moral arena instead of a political arena, or, or are we just all exhausted where we just want these people to do our job and leave everybody the hell alone? Well, honestly, I think it's a mixture of both. I think that people are tired of the hypocrisies and the double standards that we're seeing, and I think that there's a difference between bending the rules or breaking the rules in certain situations. Um, but when you look at COVID and the pandemic and where it was and the rules that came down, you know, as recommendations from the CDC into policies statewide, local wide, I, you know, I just started to watch the news and look around me and realize that why, if it's really for our safety and security and our public health, why is it okay for them to continue to get their hair done, to fly their jets, to go down to Florida, to go to Mexico on their trips, but it's not okay for us? And I think, now this is, a, this is something that's been happening for decades. This mm -hmm. isn't like, if you thought I was going to hit you with new news on that, I think, <laughs> I think people are going to be disappointed. This has happened or whatever. And I think that the thing that made everybody hypersensitive was that they... There was there was always been a not for me but for thee thing, but the the this heightened level of shaming people into not doing it this way all of a sudden made like Bacha said on her mm -hmm. on her radar uh, on her on her radar with Rabia on the hill rising, there they couldn't just say hey you know you know we enforce these policies and mistakes were made and let's just let's just see if we can move on and learn from that we you still have people out there saying that if you don't listen to this guy you don't believe in science you still have people out there saying that if you don't get if you didn't get your back you don't care about your grandma. You still have people out there that are wearing like, uh, not even like surgical masks or the N95, looking, they're looking like freaking Zorro, like they're going to rob a bank more than protect themselves, saying if you don't do this, you don't care about your fellow man. And that's where uh, uh, um, the center of my art comes from, where they 
it's really, really hard for them to come back to come back from this. It's really hard for them to come back from this. So Jason, one of my biggest issues with the leadership that we saw during COVID was that as information came out, as data was released, there was no acceptance or recognition of the mistakes or the false data or anything as it came out. Speaking from a leader myself, as a coach, I own up when I make a mistake because to me, that serves a really good example that it's okay to make mistakes. You, you're honest and then you move forward in a hopefully constructive and productive way. But that was one of my biggest even um, criticisms of Trump was he didn't go on air and say, well, here's where we are now. This is where we were two weeks ago, and this is why we've changed, or these are the numbers that have changed. It was never an exception of where the data was versus where it used to be. It was always like Batia said, this is the rules. These are what we're going to do. These are the, this is the science. Didn't it sound so familiar to it's like some of the lines you're saying in this house, we, we follow the science just to. There's still, signs. Sorry, yeah. There's still signs on the lawns of people. Mm -hmm. There's still people wearing masks around. And the only thing that I, I think in my head when I see that is that person either has an immunocompromised, you know, immune system or a family member at risk, but also. But what does that matter for the elites? Like <laughs> uh, I mentioned the Super Bowl in, in my diatribe, right? Yep. Did you know that two weeks before the Super Bowl? In that very stadium, SoFi Stadium, the NFC Championship game, Mayor Carsetti and Governor Newsom were taking massless selfies with Magic Johnson. <laughs> yes, I did I mean, see can that. Can you pick a better, uh, I mean, besides Biden, who, who's on the verge of forgetting who's going to run against in 2024, um, can you think of a better, a bigger poster board for the immunocompromised <laughs> than to not have your mask on and to be exposed to this and possibly die from it? Yeah. And again, that's where the hypocrisy comes to me and where I started to really look at the data and look at making decisions that were best for me and my life and my family, because the elites are obviously doing that for themselves and they're making those choices. Who's, who are they to tell me how, what's best for me and my family? Mm. They're not, they don't know me, Ashley Clark. They don't know what I do every day. So how can they tell me what's best for me? They can't. And that's a lesson to everybody out there. If you want to know something's really dangerous, take a look. Take, just take a look at what the elite are doing. <laughs> if the elites of people are wearing masks everywhere they go, we are in deep trouble. As part of Undivided, we want to hear from you, the audience, with your perceptions and your questions. One of the questions we received this week was about the Tennessee shooting. Do you think that if Tennessee had stricter gun laws that that shooting would not have happened? No, no. And I, and I hate when these school shootings happen. All they do is talk about that, that this person gets in their aisle about gun control. This one gets in his aisle about, oh, they're coming for all of our guns. And, and it's this false dichotomy where the problems never get solved. Where, we, where Wendy Jones, who's missing today, God, God, God bless her, but I wish she's, she's here in spirit when I say this. We're not having this conversation about mental health. Mental health is the ultimate mo modern prevention that gun, no form of gun... Um, gun restriction or gun freedom can ever cure her. I would definitely have to agree with that set sentiment. Um, the other question that we got this week, and the question that we're going to leave you with is this. After listening to the Twitter files, did you hear that? Did you hear Matt Taibbi talking about the Restrict Act? Hmm. Do you know what the Restrict Act is? I hadn't heard about it until you said something well, this morning. I, I got to tell you, I, I heard a little bit about it on the Hill, and uh, Russell Brand had actually had Matt Taibbi on his show, as well as um, um, Sabby Sabs. Big shout out to her. The Restrict Act is basically an, an, a, a law passing, um, a, or a law that they're trying to pass to make sure that apps that they consider threatening to the security of the United States of America gets banned. Um, now, we know that this was, we all believe this is an attack on TikTok, but I believe in my personal opinion, it's a haymaker. It's an end around to try to ban um, certain people that have free, free, certain venues that have free speech here. For example, mm -hmm. if, if you got a problem with Joe Rogan, maybe they go after Spotify because that's Swedish, right? Uh, you got a problem with Rumble, that's American, but 
And nowhere in this law was written, it was TikTok even written in this. So everyone says it's TikTok because they think they're trying to protect our children from, but I'm like, how the hell are our children, what the hell are our children gonna say on TikTok that's gonna threaten our national security? It didn't, it didn't make sense to me. So the restriction act is basically a law that by the way, they can, uh, if they pass it, they can throw you in jail for 20 years or fine you up to a million dollars if you use your VPN to use an app that's banned. That's what we come to. That's what we come to. And I really try to avoid this because I don't want to be the free speech guy every week. You know, I want to touch, touch on other things, but here we go. Because um, the protection of our First Amendment rights and the people who are trying to violate it is once again on, the, on episode two, reared its ugly head. <laughs> don't want to end sad though. I want to end happy. I'm really, really happy to have you on the show. Wendy Jones, we miss you. Until next week, happy Easter. For Ashley Clark, I'm Jason DeBeas. We are undivided. Mm-hmm.